Hi everyone, this is Liam Eagle. I'm the Editor-in-Chief here at the Web Host Industry Review. I'd like to welcome you to uh, another of our WER webinars. Uh, today, our, our, we're doing, uh, the, sorry, our session today is called Getting Customer Support Right, Choosing the Best Model for Your Hosting Business. And uh, it's going to feature Todd Mitchell, the GM of Dedicated Hosting and Global Services at the Planet, who has done quite a few of these webinars with us now. And uh, if you've been to some of the other ones, I'm sure you're familiar with him. I'll let him introduce himself a little better in a moment. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just give you a sense of how it's going to go. Uh, Todd's got some slides he's going to go through. Uh, we're definitely going to save some time at the end for a Q&A, but if you have questions, you can feel free to submit them throughout the presentation. I'll be keeping an eye on those. And if there's something that's really relevant to what's being said at the time, I'll try to find a polite point to interrupt with those questions. Otherwise, we'll try to address them all right at the end. Uh, and if you submit a question that doesn't get answered during the course of the presentation, um, we're going to have a record of all the questions that were submitted, so we can certainly follow up uh, outside of the webinar afterwards by email or phone or whatever. And uh, finally, Todd's going to have uh, his contact info up on the screen near the end of the presentation, so you can certainly reach out to him directly with any sort of private questions you might have. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Todd and let him introduce himself and give him control of the... Uh, the uh, <laughs> the the presentation there. Todd, you there? Hey, Liam. <clears throat> just waiting for you to. Uh, sure. To Oops. I'm sorry. I'm just having a momentary problem with that. That's okay. Well, <laughs> let me just introduce myself while um, you hand over control. So. Um, there we go. As Liam mentioned, my name is Todd Mitchell. Uh, I have uh, been in web hosting for uh, some time now. <clears throat> and hopefully you can see the, uh, the slideshow. Uh, Liam. Yeah, good. Um, so I've been in web hosting for about 10 years now. Um, you know, various roles throughout my career thus far. So uh, my first role was with a company um, in Montreal called Natural Disguise, where um, I was responsible for the <clears throat> IT and hosting operations. And it was an um, online interactive media company. So we scaled up very quickly to meet uh, many of our clients' needs. So you know that's where I sort of cut my teeth. After that, I uh, joined a company called Site5. It's uh, a pretty popular web hosting company. It's been around for some time. Um, probably about 10 years now, maybe a little bit longer. And um, I ran Site 5 from 2002 to 2007. Um, that's really where I got a huge bulk of my hosting experience. <clears throat> and uh, in 2007, uh, I decided to leave Site 5 and uh, was asked to come join the planet and help them uh, grow and expand their business. So I've been um, helping the planet now since 2007, so just, uh, just about three years, just over three years now. So I'm based in Houston, Texas. Um, that's where I'm calling from today, where it's, you know, 100 degrees out and near 100% humidity. I uh, love the summers down here. And uh, <clears throat> uh, today, really, what I want to talk to you guys about is a couple of things. One is just hosting opportunity and what that really means to you. And then we'll start to dive into some of the service model and, and customer customer support um, ideas that I have. Just one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, um, customer support and, and some of the ideas that I'm mentioning today are sort of broad spectrum type of ideas, and they may not apply to your specific business. So um, really today is just uh, a way to think about support, um, things to consider, and then take some of that back to the shop and sort of make your own mix and bake your own pie to figure out what works for your business, what works for your customers. So I'll start to step through that a little bit. And <clears throat> I'm not going to kill you with slideshows or PowerPoint. Uh, just have a few slides to go through. I really like my presentations to be fun, um, not filled with a lot of words. So um, it's just going to be a sort of a discussion. On the screen right now is my contact info. I've done this for the last um, four webinars, including this one. Uh, my email address is there. Uh, my personal or my, my business mobile phone number is there as well. So if you guys have any specific questions, any concerns, um, just 
you know, want to get my opinion on something, whatever, um, feel free to call or email anytime. Um, if you're going to call, please make sure it's during business hours. Uh, but text anytime or send me an email. More than happy to sit down and talk to you on an ad hoc basis or if you want to put some time aside. Feel free to, to get a hold of me. Love speaking to everyone in the industry. Um, I Hosting is my life, so if you have any questions at all, I've probably had a bunch of the experiences or have seen them based on our in, install base. So would love to, to speak to it. So just as a reminder, if um, you are new to the webinar series, um, the plan has been putting on, uh, we've put on four webinars, including today's. They're not sales pitches like you might find in other webinars. Um, what we really want to do is just add value to the hosting market, um, bring some um, knowledge, some experience, and um, just some <clears throat> intellect to different aspects of hosting so that we can improve the industry as a whole and start to make it a more sophisticated, more complex business and a little bit ad uh, less ad hocish as it has been in the past. So some of the topics we've covered in the past, and you can find them on the word.com or you can find them on the Planet's blog, some of them included developing your hosting business model where we spoke about uh, really customer density and revenue per server. Really interesting if you get a chance to check it out. Um, we also spoke about getting more customers for your hosting business. This was um, a discussion around customer acquisition, uh, where you get more customers, how much should it cost to acquire customers, um, affiliate programs and things like that. So that's also out there. The last one we did was expanding your hosting business with cloud services and cloud hosting. That was a um, really interesting um, deck that we went through with Carl Meadows. Uh, if you get a chance to check that out, we all know that, that hosting um, continues to expand in cloud most especially. So that really rolls into my second chart. And you know, before we get into customer support and, and what the service model looks like, let's start to understand the opportunities, right? And what you start to see, and really what we all know is that Hosting is really exciting, right? It's a 24-7 service operation. You have businesses depending on you for their livelihood. And uh, more and more people are starting to um, send their IT needs, their hosting needs to hosting companies rather than keeping things within uh, their data centers or within their offices. What this chart starts to show from Oppenheimer and Co, and for the Colo piece we grab some data from Tier 1, is that Hosting continues to grow exponentially and very, very quickly. So when you lump shared, dedicated, and complex infrastructure together, you see 15% uh, compounded annual growth rate. That's huge. Um, you know that you start to see a huge amount of dollars there, and these are all in millions. So you know if you take the, the decimal away, the, you know you're talking cloud services. It's going to be a six billion dollar industry by 2013. Same for complex hosting, dedicated hosting 2.1 billion, shared hosting 4.4 billion. So what you can see is, you know, there's plenty of pie here available for everybody, and there's massive opportunity. So you have your traditional hosting that's growing very quickly at 15% compounded annual growth rate. Then cloud services is exploding, 62% um, growth from 2007 to 2013. That's ridiculous. You don't see that in very many market segments. And I think we'll continue to see cloud services um, grow exponentially quick um, in the near future as the platforms begin to mature. So you know you have to wonder why cloud's growing so quickly and I'll touch on it briefly because I think it's important and it's you know one of the reasons why we're in the hosting business, probably one of the reasons why you're considering the hosting business. Um, or maybe one of the reasons why you're looking to even outsource what you have to a cloud provider. So the chart that you're looking at right now is um, <clears throat> an internal rendition uh, by the planet of Gartner's Hype Cycle. Gartner's Hype Cycle has five different areas, all the way from a technology trigger all the way to a plateau of productivity. The difference really is the amount of hype that's going into a specific term or a specific technology and um, how mature that technology or hype has um, gotten. 
And so when you start from the right and you move back to the left, you see co-location. Everyone knows that it's a real estate play. Rack and stack servers in someone else's facility. They keep them online. You have to go in and service your own gear. Shared hosting came along, which is simply carving up a dedicated hosting server into many slices for some amount of money. Um, generally not guaranteed resources. Everyone really knows what that is today. GoDaddy has done a great job sort of bringing that to the forefront with a lot of their Super Bowl commercials. And a lot of people have their own personal forums and uh, websites, blogs, and what have you. So it's very much the, uh, the norm and almost uh, a common household term uh, today. Dedicated hosting and virtualization are relatively new. The dedicated hosting market, we could probably say, is about 10 years old. It sort of started back in 99, 2000. And it's expanded very quickly since then. Virtualization is old but new. It's you know over the last probably five six years, it's gained a lot of traction, um, mainly from VMware, who's done a great job with their services um, and their products. And of course, a lot of the open source stuff um, is available today that uh, has been great, and it's sort of opened a new channel. Um, for service delivery and a new way to buy services. And then cloud, right? This is a really interesting uh, part of the hype cycle because cloud really isn't anything new. It's just a repackaging of stuff that already exists. So cloud is really based off virtualization. It takes all of the pieces of what virtualization has done and matured over the last X number of years and put a few more things on top, such as utility billing, the ability to scale up and scale down. A few other things, but nothing really groundbreaking, just the repackaging. And that's why cloud is moving through the hype cycle much quicker than the other areas of hosting. So co-location and shared hosting, even dedicated hosting, has taken you know 10 years to get to the plateau of productivity where it's fairly commonly used term and name. Cloud will not take 10 years to go through the hype cycle. You know, people are making predictions left and right on, you know, will it take two years, three years? You know, I think that probably in the next 18 to 24 months, there's going to be a much broader adoption of cloud hosting services than what we have today. That will probably get it down into the slope of enlightenment. Now, it still has some maturing to do uh, around platform uh, design, platform reliability. However, it will likely get through that very, very quickly as uh, I'm predicting we'll see more consolidation in the cloud services market in the near future, and that will bring maturity. Think of when hard drives came out probably in mass production in the early 80s. Um, I was just a little boy, you know, ripping apart my parents' computer at the time, but I certainly remember, you know, walking into a standard electronics store and seeing you know, 200 brands of hard drives. Now when you walk into Best Buy, Fry's, wherever you're going to go, um, there's five hard drive manufacturers, so there's mass consolidation. The same thing happened with auto manufacturers, so we'll see the same thing happen with cloud providers. There'll be consolidation. We'll probably end up with more than a handful, but you'll understand that, you know, this set of service providers handles this type of customer and that type of provider handles this type of customer. Think of, you know, web-based production versus utility billing and spiky workloads to maybe high disk I.O. So we'll start to see some interesting moves in the cloud space, um, I think, in the near future. But definitely over the 18 to 24 months, we'll start to see, you know, some really big changes in cloud, and we'll start to see some dominant players start to come out. So. Uh, I hope that, you know, all of us are a part of that. Hosting is a great opportunity for us, um, and it's finally getting to a place where it's becoming much more mature. Um, so there's tons of business out there for us. That said, let's talk about today's topic. Um, you know, I think setting the, the baseline or a framework with what the industry is going to look like and where things are headed are important, but let's talk about more tactical things. Let's sort of switch gears and talk about you know, how do we take care of customers? So obviously when you put together your hosting business, you probably wrote a business plan. 
some people write a 25-page business plan, talk about customer segmentation, market segmentation, marketing spend, and all that stuff. Others write a one-page sort of business plan that says, you know, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and it's going to make me a ton of cash. And then you have the guys who just grab their credit card, go buy a dedicated server, and they're in business, and they start to think about things as they stumble upon them. So, uh, you know, I'm a fan of all three, depending on what type of business you're starting. I think for hosting, as the industry starts to mature a little bit, we need to be a little bit more mindful of how we start businesses, how we service our clients, what aspects to consider before we make certain moves, and hopefully today um, I can sort of shed some light on some of the options you need to consider um, that you haven't already thought of, and um, you know, we'll just have a discussion. So today I'll, I'll discuss three options when it comes to getting customer, customer support right. And um, I'll, I'll talk about the, each of them individually and how they affect you and your business. But remember that not all of these apply to your business. So take what works for you. Uh, throw away the stuff that you don't think is right for your business. Totally fine. Um, but just think about what works for you and um, sort of piece together the right plan. So you've written your business plan, you've gone and bought your server, or you're renting a dedicated server from somewhere, it's racked and stacked, you know, your business plan is complete, you spent a bunch of time on it, you passed it through your friends, you got, you know, your parents' feedback, you got some other advisors' feedback, got a little bit of seed money, so you're ready to go make a purchase. Uh, your website's online. You spent, you know, the last 48 hours drinking a bunch of Red Bull, sitting at your desk, um, banging on a website, trying to get it out. You've got your merchant account ready, so you're ready to start accepting credit cards. You went and customized an online shopping cart from uh, the open source community, or you grabbed a billing application that just integrates right into your website, and you also started executing on your customer acquisition strategy. So how do you start getting customers? How do you get them in the door? Uh, and you start putting that machinery into um, in line. So you start to acquire clients. So you start to transact business online. You're up ready for business. Everything's flowing. You've done a bunch of test transactions. Uh, you're making sure that if someone puts a negative value in the quantity of a hosting order, it doesn't actually credit their credit card, but just doesn't submit the order. Something to be very mindful of. Um, I've seen that happen in the past. Um, and you sit and wait, and you're waiting, and you're watching your email very intently because you've learned from movies that if you build it, they will come. So you're expecting your transaction to happen very quickly, your first one. And sure enough, you see your parents sign up, you see your brother and sister sign up. We've all been there. It's fun to have those transactions that puts a little bit of money in your pocket because you're definitely not going to refund those orders. You're definitely going to take them. But what happens is by probably about the 15th transaction, and this has happened for me a bunch of times, it's usually between 10 and 20, you get your first real customer. And you're thinking to yourself, holy crap, uh, I now have someone who is paying me money and their business is going to start to depend on me, both from a website perspective, maybe they're generating revenue, and they probably have their corporate email, and they now rely on you. Uh, it's an interesting feeling. I've been there a bunch of times through a bunch of different businesses um, that we've built from scratch, and you think to yourself, wow, this is amazing. I actually built something that people want, but then your heart sort of sinks into your stomach and you start to think to yourself, well, holy crap, I actually need to support them. And that's a scary thought. You know, I've worked in now three very big businesses that have operated 24-7 support. And <laughs> the most common mistake that has been made in all the different industries that I've worked in, from shared hosting to dedicated to colo to interactive media, is that uh, the most common mistake is that the service model and how you deliver service to your clients is actually an afterthought. 
there's so much preparation put into website design, uh, customer acquisition, marketing materials, everything under the sun to just drive revenue and to get people in the door that you completely forget about the back end. You forget about the systems that are required. You don't think about the cost. And you don't certainly don't think about the time. And, and what I mean by time is that you're trying to run your business and trying to do technical support at the same time is very time consuming. It's not easy. And you end up spending and getting wrangled in random technical support issues that might take you half a day, three quarters of a day. And before you know it, you have spent your entire day working on a few technical support issues to support, I don't know, 500, maybe $1,000 worth of uh, monthly recurring billings when you didn't at all spend time working on new client acquisition and how to grow your business. So one thing to consider is that building your service model and then executing against your service model always takes more time than you think, without a doubt. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this happen today over the last three years at the planet. Um, we have a ton of resellers that do business with us. Um, these are uh, great companies from around the world who come and buy dedicated servers from us and resell them. They either just resell them bare metal so they don't add any services on top, or they're a value-added reseller where they add some level of management on top or, you know, a lot of the services that we offer. And uh, when you're speaking to them, you know, we, we have them in and we, we talk to them on a regular basis. And, you know, that sort of recurring theme is, wow, you know, getting the customers in the door is difficult, but it's certainly the easiest part of my business. Running a support operation is much more difficult than I thought. And so you start to ask them questions like, well, what did you think it would be like? How much did you think it would cost? How much time did you think it would consume? And some of them have very insightful answers, but some you sort of get the deer in the headlights look. And it's not just here, it's almost everywhere. You know, I've been in that same position as well where they're just caught off guard. And um, it's an okay position to be in if you're ready to do a lot of hard work in a short period of time. Um, so you just have to sort of grab your boots and, and get to work. It's, it's very difficult. So one of the things you need to consider is, you know, how do you provide service to your clients from a support perspective without killing the bank? And it can be easy and it can be difficult. And when you speak about the bank, it's not always money. Right? It doesn't actually have to be a dollar value, but it could be a uh, liability that you're accruing um, through service level agreements. It could be just time spent doing support issues as opposed to doing something else. Um, or it could simply be paying employees to do support. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the three support options I think are viable for any hosting provider and then you know, you can decide which one works well for you. <clears throat> so first you have to consider what your service model is. And what I mean by that is what are you willing to do for your clients? This is very important because it helps drive every other decision that you make. So for instance, you know, when, let's talk about shared hosting. Right, let's talk about dedicated hosting because um, I'm most familiar with that and we're close to that. Probably most of us resell dedicated servers. Um, you have to start thinking about the problems that you are willing to troubleshoot for your clients, right? And at some point you need to put a line in the sand and say, I'm willing to accept responsibility for everything on the left-hand side of this line, which is X, Y, and Z, but everything to the right-hand side, which is ABC, that's the client's responsibility. And the most important thing that I've learned over the many years in hosting is you need to make sure that you set customer expectation very, very clear when you make a sale. Whether it's a web-based sale through a shopping cart transaction or it's actually done through um, a sales rep, make sure that you're very clear on what you support and what you don't support. Because if there's any 
gray area in that, it's definitely going to come back and bite you because clients will always come back and ask you to do more than what you've asked, than what you've committed yourself to do. So you need to make sure that there's a line there. So you need to be okay with turning down some business. And the reason why that's important is one of the keys to having a successful hosting business is operational efficiency, which means that you do these 10 things very well the same way every single time. And as soon as you come up with a model for that, you can inject a ton of automation into that and increase your overall margin, your net income, so you're bringing home more money. Now, that all comes back to the service model, which is, you know, when you're a brand new business, you want to take as much business as you can so that you can grow your company. That's fine, but at some point you need to set a new DMARC that says, I really want to be X when I grow up, and that means that I'm going to target this set of clients, and I'm only going to accept this type of business. Then if someone comes to me and says that they want Microsoft Hyper-V and I only offer VMware vCloud or Zen or KVM as a hypervisor, then I'm going to have to turn down that business because I'm only tooled to sell and support this type of business. So those are just some of the things that you need to start to consider when you're setting up your service model. So as the examples show on the screen, do you plan to troubleshoot the operating system, yes or no? Um, you know, that's sort of a binary question. Are you willing to support what you delivered, uh, which is troubleshoot weird binary issues and installation issues, or is your answer no, that's the customer's responsibility, and if the customer has trouble and they can't correct it, then maybe you just offer an operating system reinstall. Network problems, that's generally table stakes when it comes to hosting, you need to support network-related issues, even if they're outside of your network. So um, that's sort of a gimme. <clears throat> Are you going to support installed scripts, Drupal, WordPress, OS Commerce? There's a ton of those under the sun. Are you going to support databases? Um, you know, things like foreign key constraints in MySQL and the different types of databases can get very complex very quickly and you need to make sure that you're okay supporting that stuff. And then any applications. You know, maybe you're a larger hosting provider and you're considering supporting Oracle or SAP or, you know, a myriad of other applications under the sun. Understand what it takes to support those, how time-consuming it is, and how it will affect your margin. You really need to build out a plan that says for every one installation of, let's use Oracle, um, financial reporting, I need to devote 20 hours of uh, full-time equivalent time to supporting that. So you have to roll that all into your margin model. So something to be very, very mindful of because it can get overwhelming very, very quickly. Hey, Todd, you, hey, Todd can I yeah. interrupt you here with, with a question? Yeah, um, so I know that uh, uh, here and there hosting providers, and I, and I, I hear this from a lot of them, uh, a lot of people who are getting into the hosting business or in the hosting business um, feel like they can distinguish their business from their competition by saying, uh, you know, we're a hosting company that provides great support. Um, with so many people setting out to do that, is I mean, is it possible to distinguish yourself with customer service at this point, or is it more about, like, getting yourself up to a, a sort of a, a acceptable level of support that everyone expects? Kind of like you were saying that, um, you know, network problems or table stakes or, or, or what have you. Yeah, I, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think it depends. It totally depends on the segment that you're going after. So if you're going after a sort of standard shared hosting, um, you, you know, that's a really commoditized market where everyone's sort of offering the same thing because, you know, there's two really popular control panels and there's, you know, a handful of really great data center providers and dedicated hosting providers. Um, so you end up sort of offering the same thing, just a little bit differently. Um, the one thing you have to be careful of is, um, you know, getting back to your business plan, which is, what do you want your competitive advantage to be when it comes to your services? And I would argue that if you're going to set out to create a competitive advantage, you need to make sure it's durable. And what I mean by that is, 
a durable competitive advantage is almost like a moat around a castle, which is, you know, it protects you from your competition and sort of puts you out on an island so that you can really be fully in charge of a specific market that you're going after. So um, you can certainly um, set yourself apart with customer support. Um, it's 100% doable, and you know when you consider um, some of our competitors, certainly um, some of them have done a great job marketing customer support, and you can make a really great business out of that. However, understand the costs behind customer support. If you say that, um, hey, I'm running a dedicated hosting business, and I guarantee that I will pick up the phone without uh, an IVR system, so no press six for this, four for that, 12 for that, and I guarantee that the person who picks up the phone will be able to correct your issue and will answer the phone within two rings, that's going to cost you a fortune. Now, that also goes after a specific type of client. You could make the assumption that someone who needs that level of support will use it and is likely very needy. Um, from a support perspective. So that might actually drive up your cost. Um, so you just have to be very careful. I think that, yeah, you can make a great business offering the best type of customer support for this segment. Maybe it's financial applications. Maybe it's business applications. P pick and choose what you want. But um, it, it's very costly. And um, you make sure that you know what you're asking for. And that, that's sort of what this whole deck is setting up is, you know, you can certainly go after having the best customer support in hosting, but make sure you know what you're subscribing to. Um, and maybe that's not the right durable advantage. Um, and it totally depends on your business plan, depends on your funding level, depends on your tolerance for certain things. Um, so, yeah, I would say that... <laughs> sort of a, an interesting question. It totally depends on the business. You know, we could sit down and talk about 10 different businesses and we could talk about how um, throwing a lot of people at the problem is a great idea. And in the same breath, we could also discuss how it's a horrible idea for the same business. So totally up to you, totally up to your region, to your business, to your segments, to your, you know, both business and customer segments. So great question, though. Let me, let me follow that up with one thing. So let's let's assume that we're talking about the the sort of smaller reseller that we started out talking about, right? And say that if you're providing shared hosting, let's say the, the in terms of of just pure throwing resources at it, you're never going to be able to match what GoDaddy's doing or what a few other companies are doing, right? right. Um, would you then say that a kind of superior service might be more like something more like just really understanding a certain vertical market that you're targeting or something like that? Um, well, let me, so yes, I mean, I, I certainly think that's a, a better way to go about it rather than going after the very broad approach, which is, hey, we're the best hosting provider and you should come to us. You're much better off going to a very narrow vertical, which is we support X application better than everyone else and here's why and have a competitive matrix that shows that you are better than every other hosting provider because of these 14 things that actually matter to the client and hopefully don't cost you a lot of money to provide. So, I, yeah, the vertical um, idea is is really smart and it's an easy way to target um, clients. And it will actually cost you less too because you're going after a very narrow group. Um, however, back to your first point, which I think is interesting and it's certainly a debate that we can have, which is you know whether or not you can effectively compete against GoDaddy. Um, with all of their customer customer support and things like that, and um, my answer to that is, I actually think that most new and upstart web hosting providers can actually compete pretty effectively against GoDaddy from a customer support perspective. But I think you have to look at it a little bit differently. So when you look at GoDaddy, they're doing things at a macro level, very large scale, very global. The area where new upstart hosting providers can really get a foot in the door and really make a difference is at the local level. So if you consider your local geographic region, so say you're talking about St. Louis or you're talking Seattle, um, and you're based out of there, you can
drum up a lot of business by walking down the local street of shops or going to your lo local chamber of commerce events and drumming up business there. And the, the best thing about that is you create personal relationships. Those are durable, right? Those will never be replaced by some corporate giant who is pitching, you know, a service that's five dollars less than yours. People value relationships. The other thing which is great from a service model perspective for people that do business with you locally is they're in the same time zone. So when you start to, con to consider customer support issues, uh, they're really only going to call you during business hours and likely not even on the weekend. So um, you know, when you start to consider your lifestyle and support expense, uh, rather than operating 24-7, maybe you can cut back to just 12 hours or 10 hours a day. And that's really where you can make a lot of differences. Go after the local market. And you know, people always think uh, online advertising is the best thing. Let me attract as many clients as possible. But maybe when you look at your business plan and your service model, maybe the best bet is fewer clients but higher dollar and local so that you don't have to work a ton of hours. So, uh, so sort of the, the devil's advocate to your, your point about not being able to compete against GoDaddy. I actually, uh, uh, I totally sort of appreciate what you're saying there. The, the, uh, I can totally envision the kind of customer who's like, you know what? They may not answer the phone 24 hours a day, but when they call me back, it's the CEO or whatever. If, if, if you're a small company that, that has that kind of personal relationship with their customers, right? My, my, my thing I'm curious about is when you sort of set up that thing, like you said, you're getting out of the gate, you go around to the Chamber of Commerce, or you, you walk down the street and just walk into businesses and sort of offer them your services and build those personal relationships that way. Are you sort of handcuffing yourself to a certain size or are you limiting the, the potential for, your, for yourself to grow or are you just saying that, you know what, at some point that, that might change, that personal relationship might become an impossibility? Or is, I mean, how do you handle that? Uh, you know what? Totally depends on your business plan. So, uh, it, it's a really cool question because it gets back to lifestyle. Um, and I think when you start to talk about lifestyle, it starts to determine how you want to run your business. And what I mean by that is, so maybe you decide to limit your hosting business to St. Louis, and maybe the addressable market in St. Louis is a maximum of I don't know, 10,000 hosting customers. You know, assume that there's, I don't know how many people are in St. Louis, let's say 500,000. You say 10,000 are willing to do business with you, so it's a very small percentage. But um, there's a high probability they're willing to pay more because you're local. Um, you have a really good relationship with them. And what you start to develop is, um, is an interesting fork in the road. And so there's two types of businesses that I think of. Well, there's more than that, but I think there's, there's two easy delineations you can make. One easy delineation between two things. One is what I call lifestyle business, which is I run my local business and I have 10,000 local clients in St. Louis. They all pay me $20 a month. So I'm bringing in, you know, $200,000 a month. My expenses are, you know, 150,000. So I, my net income is $50,000 a month that's going into the bank. I take a portion of that for my living expenses. And what you've created is a lifestyle business, which is you sort of work your standard eight to 10 hours a day. You're putting you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a month into the bank. You're growing wealth over time, but you're not looking to hit a grand slam, right? It's just slow and steady. You like the pace. It's manageable. You still have personal relationships with all your clients. And it allows you to spend time with your family and you make decent money in the, in, the progress, in the process. The flip side to that is, yeah, you start off local, but maybe your dreams are to be the size of Rackspace, which you know, is doing $650 million a year. That's when things change drastically for your clients. They go from having the personal relationship where Todd's calling the Liam and saying, hey, can you reboot the X, Y, and Z because the you know, flux capacitor isn't working versus you know, calling into a call center that's based in Arizona and you're not really sure who you're getting, you don't really feel like you're getting the attention you deserve and there's a high probability that you're going to start to see increased churn and your customer acquisition costs are going to go up and, you know, there's, so that's why that's a really cool question because 
you have to decide yourself what type of business you want to run. Do you want something that allows you to do things in life where you can get away from your business and put some money in the bank? Or do you really want to build this massive conglomerate internet, multi-million dollar international global company? And it's, I mean, they're two totally different types of companies. And uh, some require much more work than others. And it, it all depends on what you want at the end of the day. I like one type of business. I like another type of business for a different, you know, whatever project you're working on. So, um, yeah, so not really a direct answer uh, to your question, Liam, but um, it's really up to you. It, it all depends on what you want out of life and what you want out of your business. Okay. Um, obviously, probably good idea to let you move on past slide number three or <laughs> wherever we are. But uh, I have one interesting question from, from a, an audience member who I thought that would be, sorry, but I thought would be really pro uh, appropriate at, just at this point. Yeah. Um, somebody said that they're, they're very interested in, in your sort of local market idea, and they were saying that they're, in their experience you get sort of a different, and I, I might be misreading the question a little bit, so... Um, you know, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what they're saying is they've seen that they sort of see a different relationship develop when they contact the customer versus when the customer comes to them. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's huge, right? And um, I'll tell you a little story. I'll try and keep it short because we were sort of short on time. But, um, you know, back in 2007, and this isn't a sales pitch, so don't take it as that. It's just a personal experience that I know off the top of my head, which is in 2007, we started to build our managed hosting business um, internally at the planet. And we started to look at the competitive landscape. And, um, you know, we, we didn't want to turn into a people shop. We didn't want to have 2,000 people working in managed hosting. We wanted to provide enough sort of hand-holding, but... Um, still have a lot of the automation and tools in place so that clients could self-service. And one of the, there's really two key themes that uh, I think came out of that discussion back in 2007, and it holds true today, um, and uh, I think it holds true for a lot of businesses. Um, but, you know, the one key one that came out was being proactive is a huge, differentiator when it comes to hosting. When you look at a lot of hosting offerings that are available today and the services that you layer on top, a lot, and I, by a lot I mean the vast majority are uh, reactive based. So your server's running along, it falls offline for whatever reason, the hosting company calls you and says, hey, your server's offline. That's great, but the server's probably been offline for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And uh, you know, you've lost some amount of business, maybe emails have bounced. It can become um, an issue. What we found is that if we call, if we spoke to clients before it happened, so we could trend, analyze, and start to predict when servers are going to fail because of whatever performance issue or bottleneck or, or threshold, um, it totally changes the conversation and it starts to create a level of loyalty that is, uh, I would say, very durable. And so rather than getting the phone call after the fact, you get the phone call before it happens, you have someone speaking to you that has a solution or a couple solutions, some that might impact your environment, some that might not. And fixing the problem before it happens sets you apart like you would not believe and that personal relationship and uh, that level of service is durable. And clients, even for a thousand, thousands of dollars of difference per month, will not break that because they love that level of service. So um, getting back to the question of sort of reactive versus proactive, Proactive, if you can afford to do it in your business model and in your service delivery model, by all means, figure out how to do it because it will keep clients happy forever. And, you know, when you're a hosting company, bad things happen. We deal with 
bleeding edge technology all the time. Something's going to fail eventually, server fails, network dies, whatever. Um, clients are super forgiving when that stuff happens, when you have been on top of your game for every other incident that's been expected or scheduled um, or predicted. So yeah, I would say that if you can afford to do proactive service, Go for it. It will. It makes a much better business, um, and your client base will be second to none, and your churn levels will be super, super low um, for support-related stuff. Now, financial issues and what happened, whatever. Um, you know, there'll be churn there, but strictly churn caused by support-related issues, very, very low. So, hopefully, that addresses the question, um, Liam. Do you think that that was Close. I think so. I think it might have actually been a a, a, a customer acquisition uh, question. Actually, I think I'm getting a confirmation here of that. But I think it was more about if you approach the the client and that is the impetus for the relationship, as opposed to the client finding your website and through Google. Oh well, yeah, that's a completely different question. But um, it it you know the the one thing that you have to be careful of is that they need to know about hosting and they need to. They need to need it. <laughs> they need to want it um, because uh, during customer acquisition, uh, a lot of times you don't want to be doing customer education because that will take a lot of time and drive up your customer acquisition costs. Your best result is to go to like local events like the standard Linux events or the Microsoft events or the WordPress events where everybody knows about hosting. Um, those are the those sort of target-rich environments, if you will. Um, for hosting customers, and if you can get them locally, then uh, you'll you'll do very very well. So that was a shorter answer, and hopefully it answered the right question. I think so. <laughs> good. I want to see your other slides. So I know it's <laughs> really good. So um, let me motor through them real quick. Um, I know that we'll probably have a couple of questions at the end. Um, so we have about 12 minutes left. So let me sort of pick up the pace a little bit. And uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. But I probably have about three or four slides left. And some of them are really obvious, so we don't have to spend a lot of time there. But um, So moving on to the next slide. So first we spoke about sort of what's your service model and what are you willing to do, to your, do for your clients. The next question that you need to ask yourself before you start to develop a service model is what have you promised your clients? And this will heavily affect how you service them, which is, do you have fulfillment guarantees? Are you saying that, yes, I will deliver your server, your service, your whatever within, within X period of time? And this gets back to service level agreements where, you know, you say that you will deliver X within Y period of time, and if not, you owe me Z. Um, and a lot of times that's a service credit. So it's actually real money coming out of your pocket. So this needs to be a really sort of comprehensive, um, very sophisticated discussion on what you're willing to promise and what you're not willing to promise because it will affect every part of your business and even more so if your business isn't highly automated. Um, what about hardware replacement FLAs? Your a server that you sold is now offline. Uh, are you promising that you'll get it back online or at least that piece of hardware swapped within a period of time? What about support responsiveness guarantees? This is something that we promise in managed hosting. Um, we have tons of metrics uh, around this, and we watch this like a hawk because we guarantee that we'll get back to you within 15 minutes on any severity, one issue. Um, very important to those clients because something has gone wrong in their environment. Maybe they did a code push and ruined the operating system. Maybe they were restoring a database and it keeps failing and they're offline. So that's very important. What about network guarantees, network uptime guarantees? Also very important to consider. So uh, just more of the things that you need to start to consider when um, developing sort of your service model. Um, are you able to hold up to these? Um, you know, you don't want to put something out there and never live up to it because you'll develop a, a very poor reputation in the market. Also, you also have to consider your liability. Right? As you start to grow your company and you add more and more clients, are you okay with the liability? Do you have the necessary insurance policies in place to back you if 
something catastrophic happens. So for instance, you now have, you now have 10,000 clients, you guarantee them 100% network uptime, and you have a router fail, and everything's offline for five hours, and your SLA means that you now owe your clients $250,000. Uh, are you able to take that sort of service credit hit? Do you have an insurance policy in place to cover that so you can recoup some of that expense? All things to consider. And then at the end of the day, does it matter? Um, consider the clients you're going after. If they you know, only use you for email or they only use you occasionally for X, Y, and Z, you might not need to have very, very um, strict service level agreements. Maybe they're okay with four-day fulfillment times and network guarantees of 95%. So understand the market that you're going after and then tailor your service level agreements for those markets um, so that you don't put yourself in a bind when you don't need to, um, especially when clients um, really don't expect it. So you sort of put all this stuff on the plate and we've spoken about a hundred different things today, but um, you know, we got sort of talking about lifestyle business. And uh, I've certainly looked like this um, a couple of times in my career. And so it sort of looks familiar. And I'm sure a lot of people that are doing support today or run their own businesses have sort of been in a similar situation um, where you're just losing your mind because, you know, a hundred things are going wrong and nothing seems to be working. So, you know, <laughs> when you start to build a service model, do you want to look like this? Um, is your significant other willing to put up with uh, sort of this mood at the end of the day, every day, seven days a week? Um, but what will your kids think if, you know, mom or dad is always angry and screaming at the computer in the back room? And, you know, is this good for you? Is this what you want in your life? Is this good for your health? You know, if everyone's at different parts, in their life where maybe they can put up with um, working 16 hours a day, seven days a week for five years to build their business. But, you know, other people are, you know, sort of wanting to have a little hobby business on the side and there's no way that they'll ever be able to sort of deal with that type of madness. So understand um, what type of lifestyle uh, you want to live and, and that will help you better understand um, what service um, uh, models to select. So when you start to consider service models, you know, as I mentioned, there's three different types and we'll go through them real quick in a second, but consider the contact methods. Um, telephone is certainly popular, but I would say that its popularity is uh, starting to decay and, and erode over time. Uh, we have very few people that call us into our contact center. Um, a vast majority of our contacts here are actually live chat so online chat through our website, and also through just standard tickets. And so a lot of it's text-based, which is really great for us because we can multitask. Um, and then, of course, we have the occasional in-person visit, which um, is interesting because you don't really get to see your clients a lot of times in hosting. But keep in mind when you start to step through the different support uh, models, the different contact methods, and how they um, how each of the different service models handle each of the support methods. So again, the support methods, telephone, live chat, ticketing system, and in-person. So let's talk about the, the three different types of customer support model. And I know we're running a little bit late here, so I'll zip through these pretty quickly. And if you guys have any questions later, just reach out to me. I know that we're sort of running up against the, uh, the 3 p.m. hour on the East Coast. But um, when you get back to the guy who's sort of losing it on the computer, um, that could be any one of us, depending on <laughs> what size of hosting company we're working for and what service model um, we decided to go after. Um, so do-it-yourself is very, very popular amongst uh, resellers. A lot of resellers are sort of bootstrapped. There's not a lot of money. There's not a lot of seed money. There's no venture capital money. You know, it's really sort of what do you have on your credit card and Hopefully it will continue to go through month over month until we start to grow this business. Do-it-yourself is very tough. Um, we did it at Site 5 back in 2000 when it got off the ground. And everyone was wearing 13 different hats, doing support, doing sales, doing coding, doing you know everything under the sun. 
that's great for a little bit, but what you find is that you know you're not Superman or Superwoman, and you eventually start to burn out. And do it yourself is okay, but if you're going after a global customer base, you really need to be available 24/7 for any sort of basic shared hosting or dedicated hosting offering. Uh, just understand what you're getting yourself into. It's uh, it's a lot of work to do it yourself, and I'm not sure that I would be able to do that again, um, just because of the amount of pressure and time it takes to, um, to just do it yourself. Um, but if you do the, if you consider the, the local option, it might be a little bit easier to do it yourself because the hours are limited. Um, you have a smaller client base, and hopefully they're not as price sensitive, so you can make more money off. Obviously, next is just outsourcing. <clears throat> so if you decide that you don't, really don't want to handle customer support yourself because it takes too much time, uh, your time isn't worth it, you'd much rather spend your time doing customer acquisition, maybe you're not even good at it. Maybe your strengths are sales and marketing and aren't even technical support. So something to consider is outsourcing. And there's a hundred different options Outsourcing doesn't mean offshore. You can certainly outsource within North America, and you can do white label. You can not do white label. They can handle telephone. They cannot handle telephone. There's, you know, 50 different options that you can choose from, and it's really, you know, sort of go down the list and pick these 13 things you'd like them to do for you, and the, the other 17 things you'll do yourself. I can go through outsourcing to great depth because a ton of our clients do it. Um, and they use it and pay for it and love it, and it's very successful for their businesses. Again, it gets back to your service model. So understand what outsourcing means. Is it important to your business? What types of questions are they answering? Are they capable of handling the technical questions? What does escalation look like? Um, do you even need to outsource? Again, if you go the local route, um, you could probably just do it yourself. And lastly, um, which is generally the most expensive route, is in-house. Couldn't find a cool graphic for in-house, so I got the little guy standing in the house, so I thought it would be appropriate. <clears throat> but in-house technical support is certainly an expensive endeavor. You have to have the facility. There's um, all the health care benefits and the salaries where with outsourcing, maybe you just pay by the live chat, maybe you just pay by the ticket. So, um, you know, there's the, the pros and cons are certainly there. With outsourcing, um, you, your bill could very much be variable, where one month it's $100 and the next month it's 15000 Totally depends on how chatty your customers are that month. With insourced, everything is sort of a sunk cost. It's very static, and you understand that you have you know, 100 guys on staff that cost you 100 bucks a day, and your costs really won't go up or down very much with the exception of maybe your, your telephone system expense. So in-house is certainly an option. Um, it doesn't have to be big either. It could just be one or two guys. Um, so something to consider. I know a lot of people who start web hosting companies sort of go up through the ranks. They start doing it themselves, realize that it's consuming too much time, then they go the outsourced route do that for a little while until the business grows a little bit more, cash flow frees up, and then they start hiring people, and they start to grow their business that way. So <clears throat> it's not like you just have to choose one and you're stuck on it. You can actually move back and forth between the different options depending on what the economy looks like, what your service offering looks like. Are you introducing a new service that uh, maybe your in-house guys aren't capable of handling? Maybe you're a Linux house today and you want to introduce Windows. You don't want to go hire a bunch of Windows guys because you don't know what sales projections look like. Do it yourself or outsource it. Very simple, and just segment your customers. So those are the, the three options. So you know, just sort of in summary, um, as we start to wrap up here, is consider the impact customer support has on your business. Um, you know, it's important that support is handled very well. Otherwise, it has a negative impact on your brand. And word of mouth will kill you very quickly if your support um, fluctuates. So try and keep it consistent. 
What do you personally want to concentrate on? Are your efforts best spent on sales and marketing rather than support because that's what you love and what you're good at? Make sure you do what you love and what you're good at because you'll knock it out of the park every single time. Um, if you're trying to struggle through something you're not great at, it's going to be long days for you and the customers aren't going to get the best possible customer experience. And then lastly, what's your time worth? Should you be spending time recompiling PHP on a Linux web server or should you be busy trying to figure out how to um, increase operational efficiency and increase automation within your business? So just a handful of questions that you should think about when you start to um, look at your service delivery model and what works for you. So Liam, uh, that's really the conclusion. I know that we had to sort of rush through the last few slides pretty quickly. Um, sorry that you know we ran a little bit long. If anyone on the line wants to talk about more of those options individually, feel free to drop me a note or give me a phone call. Um, I would love to spend some time just going through the various options, just having a conversation. So Liam, I'll turn it over to you, and do we have any additional questions that you might have that have popped up in the, the chat? Yeah, Todd, I was going to say, we, we have only one more question that didn't get answered from the audience, so why don't we just answer that question? We'll go a few minutes long. I mean, we're just at one hour right now, so we'll go maybe th two, three more minutes, and uh, you can just leave your contact information up on the screen, and if anyone has any more questions, they can certainly get in touch with you afterwards. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. Okay, so the, the last question we have here, and it's a pretty interesting one, is I guess uh, it's how important is a, is a sort of a public written support policy document, and how specific should that document be? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I guess it, it depends on what type of service you're offering. So, you know, we've gone back and forth internally here on whether or not we should publish um, some of the support documents that we have internally on what's supported, what isn't. And in one rendition of the website, we published uh, at least a portion of it. Uh, you know, setting customer, it really gets back to setting customer expectation around your service offering. I think it's really critically important that that's done as soon as the customer comes in the door as a potential client, even before they sign up. Now, you know, Putting a document online is tough because it needs to be so broad and address so many different questions and concerns that clients might have. It's really hard to create a catch-all without being super generic and sort of writing everybody off as you're not going to support them. And sometimes it comes off a little bit poor to clients. So, you know, think of yourself as a client going to your website browse around, you're going through some of the service offerings and it's like, well, what do we support? You click that link and it's a huge list of stuff you will and won't do. Uh, sometimes that can be a little bit distracting. It can be a speed bump for clients. And, uh, you know, that that is tough and you really don't want to put very many objections in the way of a potential sale. So what I would encourage you to do is um, have yourself or have your salespeople understand what your support matrix is. So if you're a dedicated hosting provider, make sure that they fully understand that we'll do X, Y, and Z and have some internal document that they can reference, which is, you know, okay, for operating systems, we'll do a kernel recompile. We'll make sure that we'll use YUM to update the operating system. And, uh, you know, we'll do these 14 other things. But Anything above and beyond that is really sort of at an hourly rate or we simply won't touch it. And I think it's, it's better to have an open conversation with the client rather than putting up a massive document online, which is sort of a checklist of we will and we won't do these 14 things. Um, you think of it as just putting a big barrier between you and a sale. And um, your best bet is, you know, do it in pre-sales. Hopefully you can get them in live chat or on the phone. Um, especially if you get them in live chat or phone, there's a higher probability of you closing the sale. And maybe you can upsell them to something else. And in the process, you can set expectation around fulfillment times, network service level agreements, and then just candidly ask them whether or not they have a any service-related questions that they're interested in, you know, whether it's supporting this thing or that thing. And I think you make it a conversation. If you make it a conversation, then you disarm the client they feel very welcomed, they feel like they can ask you any other questions, and you can move to the sale much more quickly. So 
Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, a little bit generic, but you know, it totally depends on the business. But definitely try and get the client on the phone and, and turn it into a conversation. There's tons of benefits to, to having a conversation in live chat or on the phone. Just for your edification, Todd, uh, the person who submitted the question thought it was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> So uh, I think we should probably wrap this up since we're about five minutes past the hour. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out and attending the, the, the webinar. I, I'd like to thank everyone who submitted great questions. Uh, thanks, obviously, to Todd for, for a really great presentation and some really interesting insight. I want to let everyone know, everyone know that this will be uh, the webinar will be a video of the webinar, including the slides, will be archived uh, on theword.com slash webinars and at blog.theplanet.com. Blogs? Zero? Yep. Okay. And... Uh, yeah, along with uh, uh, all the other Planet webinars that we've done, which is, I guess, three other ones that have all been really great. And, uh, of course, there's a bunch of other webinars at the WAR as well. And uh, so thanks very much to everyone, and uh, have a great day.